from the UK to talk about uh, gigabit wireless to the home. Hi everyone, my name is Daniel Frati, um, and yes, I did come from uh, the UK. It's a long uh, journey, but I was rewarded by this wonderful summer. Thank you for having me, and thank you um, to our partner, Go Wi-Fi, who um, first alerted us to uh, this conference. So I work for Seekler Communications. It's a company based in Israel, specializing in millimeter waves. And really what, I, what I'd like to uh, talk to you about today and try and convince you that uh, millimeter wave is perhaps the technology we've been waiting for uh, quite a long time to provide gigabit to the home. So I think that's always been the holy grail. You know, we'd all like to have broadband connectivity unlimited in any way, but of course, fiber, which is the best medium, is um, often not uh, uh, prevalent and uh, is expensive to run to every home. And, right. Um, and just to say, I put the word 5G on the presentation. Um, a, because it's quite exciting, but B, just, just that people know, you know, people think of 5G as primarily a mobile technology, but not only mobile, it's um, also true for, um, for fixed wireless. You know, the idea is to bring these kind of capacities also in fixed settings, fixed meaning stationary. Okay, so I'm going to talk primarily about two um, subjects today. First, I'd like to introduce you all to millimeter waves, and uh, which is a technology perhaps many of you have not heard about before. And um, secondly, then describe how we can use this technology or how you can use this technology to then connect, um, you know, if you're an ISP or you need uh, to provide any other kind of connectivity, how uh, to bring that about to your customers. So just before I start this, and do I need to point this at anything in particular? Um, so just press the button, it's nice and firm, be the left and the right, and okay. just hold it up a little bit. Yeah, the there we go, the thank you. Right, okay, great. Um, so just to give you a little bit of a background about fixed wireless um, access, so fixed wireless access has been tried before, not very successfully, I have to say. So I put down here on the slide perhaps um, two quite well-known examples. The first maybe to the older generation, so this was an attempt during the uh, telecom bubble, if you like, in the um, turn of the century to use technologies, fixed wireless technologies, um, such as LMDS and others, to bring gigabit capacities to the home. That never went very well. And then there was a second attempt a few years later under the umbrella of WiMAX, and that didn't work very well either. And I think now in hindsight we can um, identify the challenges that were present then um, and perhaps were missing in these technologies. So, uh, you know, if, if people are to be interested in wireless technologies, then they need to be at least as good as wireline. You know, otherwise, what's the point? If they're not as good, just use wireline, which everybody's familiar with and everybody's happy with. Um, secondly, and perhaps not less important, is the cost. So if you are going to use wireless to, to provide um, service to people, then it's got to be at a lower cost than wireline. Otherwise, you know, what's the point? Again, use wireline. And I think perhaps the third bullet, which is important in the context of this talk, is a spectrum. So the wireless spectrum, as you probably all know, is a finite resource. And um, there's only so much of it. And if you want people to um, utilize it, uh, then you need to have plenty of it so that people do get access to the spectrum. So um, this brings me back to millimeter waves. And um, I'd like to try and convince you that millimeter waves does deliver on these challenges and is therefore perhaps the technology that's actually going to um, deliver, and as I'll, I'll show you as well, is, is already delivering on um, these challenges. Oh. Okay, there we go. Right, so um, this is the fixed wireless spectrum. Again, fixed in this context means stationary as opposed to mobile. Um, and there's quite a lot of bars on here. Each one of these bars represents a what we call a band 
in the wireless jargon. So um, down there on the left, um, I grouped a bunch of frequencies under the title sub-6, meaning frequencies lower than 6 gigahertz. They're very popular, and I imagine if um, any of you here have tried doing anything in wireless, you've probably been um, working in that frequency range in the sub-6. So Wi-Fi 2.4 uh, or 802.11 AC, which is 5 gigahertz, all operate down there, um, and, and uh, a bunch of other stuff as well. Then um, there's the middle region, which I termed microwave. So microwave, I imagine, is quite popular in a country like New Zealand that's quite large where you want to take the transmission over long distances. So where that's the case, then probably it's these bands um, which extend from 6 to about 40 gigahertz that are very useful because they have certain <coughs> characteristics which help them propagate over longer distances. So this, this, is all, um, this was all the case up until about a few years ago. And then... Um, uh, the millimeter wave technology, which you see on the right hand of the picture, came along. Um, and that um, is in three primary bands. One is called the V-band, which is around 60 gigahertz. And one is called E-band, which is uh, divided into 70 gigahertz and 80 gigahertz. Okay, so this, this is uh, the part of the spectrum that I'll be talking about uh, for a little while now. Oh. I keep going backwards for some reason. No. Mm. There we go. Yeah, okay, cool. Right, okay, thank you. Okay, so what is the regulatory um, situation in New Zealand for millimeter waves? So 60 gigahertz is um, an unlicensed band, which is great basically means if you wanted to put up a wireless connection in 60 gigahertz or V-band, uh, you could just do that without speaking to your regulator at all. Uh, there's quite a lot of spectrum there, currently ranging from 57 to 64. It's a little bit wider in other countries, so um, we're hoping to see a change come about here as well. Uh, for example, in Australia, uh, they extended the V-band from 57 to 66 a few months ago, perhaps six months ago, and they're currently consulting on extending it all the way to 71, um, which is a situation in the UK, in the United States as well. So if you can imagine um, 57 gigahertz to 71 gigahertz, that's a massive amount of spectrum. Uh, so that, that's V-band, uh, 60 gigahertz, and then the other band, which as I said is called E-band, is divided between 70 and 80 gigahertz. Uh, so there's 5 gigahertz and 70 and 5 gigahertz and 80. Uh, and that's a license band, which means if you want to put up a link in these frequencies, then you need to talk to the regulator. And I believe the cost is $150 um, here in New Zealand. So that, that's all good news because it means uh, the, the bands are regulated, the millimeter wave is regulated and is permitted here in New Zealand, so it's just a, a question of you know, people who are interested um, is to just start utilizing it. Um, it just occurs to me, I haven't really discussed the term millimeter wave, so for those of you who know anything about uh, electromagnetic radiation and waves and all that kind of thing, know that there's a thing called um, a wavelength, which is inversely proportional to the frequency, and in these high frequencies, if that's of interest to anyone, then the wavelengths are a few millimeters long, which is why we call these waves millimeter waves. Okay, so what are the main characteristics of millimeter waves, and how are they different from all the other frequencies which perhaps people are more familiar with? So the first thing, I think it's quite obvious from this little diagram that I put on, on before, is the sheer amount of spectrum available in these bands. So you can see why there are um, loads of other bands in lower frequencies, they're all quite narrow, meaning the amount of spectrum available there is quite small. Um, whereas in millimeter waves, you can see by the, um, the width of uh, these bars, there's quite a lot of spectrum. This is uh, significant. First of all, it means that the spectrum is uncongested. Okay, there's so much of it. 
and uh, it means that it's just there for people to use. Uh, unlike perhaps some of the lower frequency bands that uh, I've drawn on there where you can see that the uh, bars are quite narrow. Um, and secondly, it allows us to use very wide channels. So if you've used uh, 5 gigahertz before or these lower frequencies, you know that the channels come in multiples of 10 megahertz, so maybe 10, 20, maybe 40 uh, megahertz. And if you've used microwave, they come in multiples of um, 28 megahertz, so maybe 28, 56. Here in millimeter waves, because there is so much spectrum, uh, there's a possibility of using really, really wide channels, and by that I mean you know, channels as wide as 2 gigahertz. And when uh, there is such wide, or there are such wide channels uh, to take advantage, then it's possible to pump a lot of um, bits uh, through these wide channels. And we're talking about air capacities of up to about 10 gigabits per second. Okay, so that means that you can put up a, a wireless connection, say between two points, and um, you know, that would um, provide you a connection of 10 gigabits per second. So that, that's something quite unique to this band. It's not possible to do in, in an, any other frequency band. Okay. Uh, a second characteristic which is key to millimeter waves is the fact that the transmission is very directional, okay? And, and this is quite an important thing because those of you who have had um, or, or have experience in wireless, we're always um, in that field, we're always worried about interference because uh, you know we, we put a link up and it connects point A to point B and then all of a sudden, and it works quite reliably, but then all of a sudden it doesn't. Uh, maybe because somebody else put a, another link up or um, you know, uh, just the spectrum is overutilized. So in these frequencies, in millimeter waves, uh, the, the beams that are being transmitted are very narrow. We call them pencil beams in the industry. And you can see, as so, so I put up here, they're typically between half a degree to two and a half degrees wide, which means you can have a link going in a particular direction without polluting, as it were, any other direction. So this is great for uh, frequency reuse meaning you can reuse the frequencies again and again. So for example, if I had a wireless connection pointing this way, I could then use the same frequency um, to um, implement a wireless link in a slightly different direction. In, in fact, we say that if there is a, at least three degrees in angular separation, then you can reuse the same frequency, and, and that's um, quite significant and quite unique. Um, and, of course, the consequence of this is there's in this, these bands, in these frequencies, there's no interference, uh, which means if you put up these links, you use this technology, you can rest assured that your link is not going to suffer any interference. And um, this, this um, I would say, is um, also perhaps proven by the... Uh, regulatory framework uh, approach taken to these frequencies. Like I said, 60 gigahertz is completely license exempt, but also in E-band, in most countries, it's not true for New Zealand, but in most, mo most countries, the licensing uh, mechanism is what we call light licensing, which means people have to do very little to um, register their links. Um, and this is because the regulator knows that the probability of getting any interference in these frequencies is um, very, very small, if not, um, you know, zero. Uh, another consequence of these narrow beams is that the transmission is very secure, because it means that if you're transmitting from point A to point B and anybody wanted to intercept that transmission, uh, they would need to literally be hanging in the, light, in the line of transmission. You know, they couldn't just put a, uh, an antenna up maybe a few blocks down the road in the hope of catching any of that transmission. They would actually need to be right within that one or two degree uh, beam width. And then maybe the flip side of these narrow beams is the fact that uh, because they're so narrow, it's important that any installation of these antennas is done in a very stable way. Okay, so if you're putting these up on a pole and the pole is uh, blowing in the wind and swaying in the wind and the sway is more than one or two degrees and obviously the beam is going to go in and out of alignment and the performance is not going to um, be very good. So I indeed those of you who um, have used perhaps microwave before and are used to quite, lar used to quite large dishes 
I can tell you that in millimeter waves, the largest antenna that we uh, that is used is uh, a two feet antenna, a 60 centimeter antenna. Uh, that antenna will have a, a huge gain and will have a beam width of only half a degree, and it's just not practical to use any larger antennas because the beams are going to get so narrow that it's just going to be impossible to align them. So um, I put a few photos on there just to give you a sense of what these pencil beams uh, look like in reality. So you can see here on the right, for example, this is uh, um, showing you how these radios can be squeezed together quite tightly without causing interference. And then on the left, um, that's just a hub and spokes kind of example from um, Liverpool in the, in the UK, showing a bunch of links emanating from the same point, all operating on the same frequency. And again, that's possible because the beams are so narrow. OK, so we've got abundant uh, spectrum. That's good. We've got narrow beam width. Uh, that's very good. So what are the um, less favorable aspects of millimeter waves? So the first is that it requires a, a clear line of sight, uh, meaning there must not be any obstruction in the line of sight. So whereas in lower frequencies, sometimes you can get around partial obstruction and you can go around corners, that kind of thing. In uh, these high frequencies, it's just not possible. So you have to have a line of sight. Uh, and um, I put something else a little bit more technical on here called the Fresnel zone. Uh, so those of you who have done wireless before, when you operate in low frequencies, uh, then you know that by clear line of sight, I mean more than the optical line of sight. Um, there's the sort of the shape that these waves propagate. It's a little bit like a rugby ball, and it's called um, the Fresnel zone, and um, it has to have clearance. And uh, the good thing about millimeter waves, the Fresnel zone is so small, so basically I would say to you, if you've got an optical line of sight, you've got Fresnel zone clearance, so that's good. But um, you know, if you were going to put up a, a link between two points, A and B, then make sure you can see point B from point A. Okay, and um, the last thing I want to say about millimeter waves is, is that this is inherently a short range technology. Okay, and I'll um, talk in more detail about that. So uh, V-band 60 gigahertz is attenuated by the oxygen in the air, so it happens to coincide with an oxygen absorption band, and I'll show you that in more detail in a minute, uh, basically meaning that when these uh, waves propagate through the air, they get attenuated quite heavily, so they can't reach very far. And then both V-band and E-band, so 60, 70, 80 gigahertz, are then attenuated by rain. Okay, so basically when it rains, uh, the performance can degrade, and the more intense the rain, uh, the, the more severe is the degradation. And uh, also, i uh, talk a little bit about that and um, how to go about taking all that into account to provide a very reliable connectivity. So, um, as regards distance, I put some effective maximum distances on here. This is very contentious because um, it is possible to go uh, higher, or some people might be a bit more conservative and they might prefer to go lower, but th this is for Oakland, which I understand is sort of the, the wetter regions in, New, Ze in uh, New Zealand. So if we're talking about the V-band, the license exempt band, uh, that will reach about a kilometer. Okay, this is primarily due to the oxygen absorption. And then if we talk about E-band, then I, I guess it greatly depends on what air capacity you're after and what sort of link availability you're after. So for example, if you're an ISP and you're putting one of these links into your core network, for example, you may have a 10 gigabit ring that you may want to complete using one of these uh, wireless links. So then you'd want the link to be incredibly reliable, maybe, I don't know, maybe 99.995%. Uh, and you may need the whole 10 gigabit available all the time. In that case, uh, probably not a very good idea to s stretch it over three kilometers. But, um, you know, if you're not that strict and you're happy to live with, occasionally happy to live with a lower air capacity, and that's usually not a problem for sort of Ethernet-based networks because utilization is quite low um, naturally. Or if you use something called overbuild, where you use two types of frequencies to complement each other, and I'll um, describe that in more detail, then uh, you can stretch it more, maybe up to 10 kilometers or so. 
Okay, so um, I talked about the atmospheric absorption, so I, this is a little graph here showing the absorption of um, oxygen and water in, in the air. And as you can see between the red dotted lines, this is 60 gigahertz, and uh, this is where we have a massive uh, peak. And uh, so we're talking about 15 dB per kilometer. So that's about a 70 fold, meaning after one kilometer, only one part in 70 remains of the original signal. So that's quite significant. Uh, this is also one of the reasons this, this band is license exempt, because the regulators know it doesn't propagate very far. Um, and one thing to say is that the peak, the, the actual peak is around 61 gigahertz. So the further you get away from 61, the, um, the lower the impact of this oxygen absorption, which is why it's nice to have this band extended a, a little bit. And um, I mentioned before that in other countries, it's extended beyond the 64 gigahertz um, end, and I'm hoping that um, New Zealand will follow soon. Okay, um, um, atmospheric absorption doesn't really play part in E-band in 70, 80 gigahertz. You can see here it's be in between the green lines, so it's quite insignificant, about half a dB per kilometer, so really negligible. Okay, so this is all static and well known. Um, and then I want to just mention uh, the other important factor in link design, which is um, rain. Okay, so as I mentioned before, rain plays a significant role. Um, it's basically the amount of water in the transmission path. The more there is, the more the signal is attenuated. So before I go into that in a little bit more details, I want to give you the good news. And the good news is that there is a whole bunch of other uh, adverse propagation phenomena that are there in wireless transmission that do not impact millimeter waves. So if you are used to um, using wireless or planning links in lower frequencies, then I'm sure you'll be relieved to know that all these factors that I've listed here on the right are of completely um, no consequence at all to millimeter waves. So the first one is interference. That's, um, like I said, there's no interference in millimeter waves because of the narrow beams. And inter interference is a, is a really bad one because it's, it's very hard to predict. So you might put up a link and everything might be working fine. And then uh, a few weeks later, a few months later, somebody comes along and puts in another link, perhaps even a few streets away, and all of a sudden your link is no longer reliable. Okay, so there's no, um, I would say, scientific way of quantifying this. Okay, uh, but of course it's got to be taken into account because when you've got interference, your link doesn't deliver the reliable service it should. Uh, and in this context, it's worth mentioning DFS. So DFS is a feature which is uh, mandatory in um, wireless equipment operating at low frequencies. And basically it provides a priority to uh, radars, so primarily um, weather uh, radars that operate in, in low frequencies. And basically, it means that telecoms uh, vendors who uh, develop these boxes, you know, to connect points in a wireless fashion, have to uh, back off whenever they sense radar because radar is uh, considered more important. So that's another thing that's very hard to predict. Uh, next, we come to uh, multipath. So multipath uh, is, can cause significant deterioration in lower frequencies. And it's also tricky to predict because it depends on the terrain. So it depends on how high your antenna is and how far, how high up your antenna is on the far end and what's around the line of transmission. And all that's going to determine the, all the echoes that are going to be um, received at the receiver, not directly from, not only directly from the transmitting antenna, but also from various reflections, which, um, as I said, de depend on the terrain. So that causes a, a bunch of problems like attenuation and distortion of the signal. Um, also causes something called depolarization, where you're trying to uh, transmit in a particular polarization, and the signal all of a sudden arrives in a slightly depolarized way. Um, so this is a whole minefield. And uh, then there are other issues like uh, beam spreading, which can happen due to various layers of, um, of temperature in the atmosphere. 
And then if you're trying to do non-line of sight things, then you start getting into diffraction issues, round obstruction and that kind of thing. So all of these things, if you wanted your link to be reliable and you wanted to know how reliable it is, then these are all things that you need to quantify and they're notoriously difficult to quantify. So the good news is that in millimeter waves, none of these um, need to worry you because they don't exist. Multipath doesn't exist because there are no reflections, because the beams are narrow. Uh, there's no interference for the same reason, uh, and all these other bad things don't happen. So really, it's uh, only the rain that we need to be concerned about. And the good news about rain is that it's uh, very well understood. You know, we've got long-term statistics about rain in various countries. In fact, um, I listed one of the um, uh, ITU, the International Te Telecommunication um, uh, Well-Known Open um, Databases called ERA40, which basically collects rain information on a 100-kilometer grid across the globe, and it's freely available, and you, know, you can have a look at that, and you get a very good idea of uh, what rain intensity to predict, and then you can take that into the calculation, and once you do this, you get a very good prediction of your link's performance. For example, if you need a 10, kilo, uh, 10 gigabit per second link, which operates over three kilometers uh, in Oakland, um, you use this database, you do all the calculation, and uh, you can be sure that the prediction you get for the link availability will be quite accurate. Okay, um, one, one thing I do want to mention about um, maybe overcoming the inherent limitation of short distances and millimeter waves is that some people like to deploy millimeter waves because they're upgrading their connections. For example, they may have had a 5 gigahertz connection which was able to deliver, I don't know, maybe 200, 300 megabits per second, but they need more. So they'd like to put in a millimeter wave link, but they know that the millimeter wave link will not be available 100% of the time, and specifically when it rains heavily. So then what they like to do is keep the 5 gigahertz um, link in place and use that as a backup. So basically it means that traffic then uh, propagates over the millimeter wave link, offering an air capacity of a gigabit, two gigabits, five gigabits, or whatever it is that you need. And in those very short um, instances where it rains heavily, then traffic gets automatically rerouted into a low frequency radio which is uh, immune to rain, for example, 5 gigahertz, an example, and then um, you, know, you can do that sort of thing with your favorite 5 gigahertz radio uh, or one that you have existing. Okay, so the idea is that you may, for example, get a 2 gigabit connection or a 10 gigabit connection, maybe only 99% of the time, which is not very much, but during the 1% of the time when that is not available, then at least you've got something. You know, you've got um, some, some sort of service between the two. And, and there's a picture I put on there of uh, a 15 kilometer link where at the bottom you see uh, the millimeter wave um, radio and on top you see a five gigahertz radio. Okay, it's just, just an example. So that, that is a way to overcome the uh, distance limitation. Okay, gosh, I um, need to hurry up. Okay, so um, for those of you who are hearing a millimeter waves for the first time today and think that maybe it's something um, you know, quite, um, quite niche, then uh, I put this slide on to try and assure you that that's not the case. So this is a, a picture of uh, San Francisco and every one of these green dots is an E-band uh, radio. Okay, so the reason uh, it, this, this is easy to plot because E-band is regulated in the USA, which means every E-band link going up uh, needs to go on the FCC's database, the FCC being the, the regulator in the US, so then it's easy to take the database and just plot it on, uh, on a map. So, um, as you can see, it's heavily used, um, and not only in San Francisco, of course. Okay. Um, there's also a bunch of other applications. So I know most of you um, are um, ISPs or, or sort of re related to that industry, but there are different applications, different industries which also make use of this technology, uh, such as smart cities, uh, security, and so on, taking advantage of uh, this technology. Right, so, uh, oh, this one over. There we go. So, um, as I thought most of you would uh, be ISPs or so related, I wanted to show an example of an ISP in the Bay Area in California called WebPass. 
and um, they are primarily a wireless ISP using millimeter wave technology to connect um, the various uh, customers. And um, you can see, uh, it might be hard to read because the quality is not very good, but uh, you see WebPass uh, is the fastest ISP because they are using this kind of technology that does allow them to um, have really fast connections. In fact, they were so successful that Google Fiber, who was set up to bring fiber to every home, actual fiber to every home, decided to purchase them because bringing fiber to every home proved uh, too daunting, even for Google. Okay, so um, this, this kind of um, t shows a, a typical use case of millimeter waves where uh, you may have fiber reaching some, some buildings in a neighborhood or a business park or what have you, and then the idea is that you want to extend the fiber footprint to other buildings, uh, in which case you can use something like E-band, for example, where E-band delivers the higher capacity, like I said, to 10 gigabits per second even more. Um, and then maybe for the access bit, uh, use the unlicensed 60 gigahertz. It's just a um, typical use case. Okay, so um, I'm now moving to the second part of my uh, presentation, uh, which is to talk about how to use this technology to bring gigabit to the home. So uh, I talked a little bit about fiber extension, that's particularly E-band, but I want to talk about something more interesting now, um, which is how to use V-band for the access. Okay, so uh, with V-band, with 60 gigahertz, uh, there is a, a really um, important, uh, um, I would say, technological um, uh, process going on at the moment, or has gone on, which is Wi-Fi uh, taking or embracing 60 gigahertz as their next uh, Wi-Fi uh, protocol. So as you can see here, 802.11 AD, also known as Ygig, that's, that's been ratified, and then they're working on the next one, which is called 802.11 AY, okay, which will bring various enhancements compared to AD. And I also put another one on here called Teragraph. This is a, a Facebook initiative to do things a little bit better. But irrespective of what it is, it means that the big players, um, such as Intel and Qualcomm, are interested and are producing a chipset uh, for these frequencies, for these applications. And that's always good. It's good, good for the consumer, good for the customer, because it means cost is going down. And it also means that footprint is going down. So I brought an example to show you. So this little box here, for example, operates in 60 gigahertz and will provide a gigabit connection. So you can put that on, um, on your terrace or behind a window on your home, and that's it. And you've got a gigabit connection. OK, so that, that is really the power of um, these chipsets. Um, also, what these chipsets do is they, they um, support something called beamforming, which is very important. So I mentioned before that the beams are narrow, which means when you normally put these links up, you need to take care in aligning the, the uh, antennas in the right direction. With beamforming, that's all done electronically, so you don't have to do that. So something like this will um, uh, cover a sector of, say, 90 degrees or some maybe slightly more. Um, and so it means that putting these up, you, know, you can actually email these, um, sorry, post these, not email, not yet, but post these to your customers uh, and say, you know, just, just put it on uh, the window that faces east because this is where we have our access point and it will automatically um, connect in the right direction. And uh, just to say, because we're talking about sectors, uh, those of you who have used 5 gigahertz before, you know, they also cover sectors. But these sectors, that means that the, uh, the transmission is actually 90 degrees wide, whereas here I put this, uh, it's a little bit technical, but it shows you that in these frequencies, in millimeter waves, the beams are still narrow. So although they can scan in a wide sector, they're still very narrow, keeping the interference down and uh, all these other good um, um, attributes which I was talking about before. Okay, so I see I'm uh, running a little late, so I'm going to... Um, um, hurry up a little bit. So just to say, when um, trying to, or when planning networks to bring gigabit to the home, there are various, um, I would say, topologies or architectures that people look at. Some people like to have redundancy, so they're looking at rings, so Ethernet rings, which have, have inherent, um, inherent redundancy. Okay, as you can see here, 
Um, so this is just one example from, uh, from the US, and this is perhaps a more interesting one. This is using uh, a point-to-multipoint system uh, you know, with a scanning beam, as I described before, to connect homes. This is in uh, Georgia in the US. And uh, you can see the different colors of the lines connecting. These are the, the actual beams and being the same color, meaning they're sort of within the same sector. And uh, in this example, there's uh, 350 homes, all connected, all have gigabit connectivity. Okay, so uh, the last thing to say uh, is that uh, when trying to bring gigabit to the home, it's not enough to have the right hardware. You know, obviously, you need to have a low-cost device which is able to uh, deliver that kind of capacity. But um, you know, we find more and more that people need access to planning tools because the challenges here can be quite daunting. So this is an example of a, a neighborhood in uh, Mississippi, again in the USA. And each one of these red dots is a, is a home. And each one of these red dots wants um, a gigabit connection. So how do you plan the topology for this? Are you going to go for point to multipoint? Are you going to go for rings? Do you want redundancy, yes or no? So to a great degree, that depends on the business logic of the organization. Um, you know, some, some ISPs like to put the infrastructure up there, believing that the customers will then come along. Others would like to sign up customers first and then put the infrastructure in. Um, how do you pick the, the asset location? So, like I said, this is all a line of sight technology, so ideally you'd need a, a, a point that's quite high up um, in order to see all these houses. So how do you pick it? How do you uh, optimize on the, your asset location? Um, and then, of course, it would be nice to be able to automate line of sight uh, calculation because you know you, the obvious way to do this is to send somebody to site to make sure there's a line of sight. But when you have that many homes, it's just not viable. So the data is available today. You know, lots, lots of places have um, LiDAR data, which is available. Google Earth does quite a good job of providing that. So it'd be nice to be able to look at a neighborhood like this and uh, be able to tell straight away where are the possible lines of sight. Um, and then we go on from there to a link availability calculation and even equipment configuration. Okay, so uh, you, know, you don't want to have to configure individually um, radios in each of these homes. Okay, so um, I hope that gave you a taste of millimeter waves and how that can help with fixed wireless access. Any questions? Oh, this side. one there. Yeah, okay, we're good. I assume somewhere there's going to be a question about how hard fiber to the home is. <laughs> um, I was well, you were talking about mounting them to windows. Does Sorry, it, I can't hear. Sorry. A little further away. Um, you were talking about mounting uh, the access point or the, the uh, client radios to the windows. Um, how's the attenuation through the glass? Um, so usually not very much. Uh, it depends, of course, on the type of glass and how much metal there is in the glass. But usually, I would say two, three dB, um, and that's assuming that the angle of incident, which means the angle that the beam is he hitting the glass, is you know not extreme, not very much. Anyone else? All right. Very good. Okay. Thank you very thank much. You much. Thank you. All righty. So uh, next up we have uh, Kay Kachow um, talking about uh, how to get your network ready for